Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to introduce you to Anjan Chakravarti, who is professor of philosophy at the University of Miami, working on philosophy of science, epistemology, and metaphysics. A lot of fun. We have very nice memories of Anjan's previous uh, talk in Principia and our interaction. So it's really a, a, a pleasure and a privilege to introduce the talk by Anjan. Please, Anjan, with you now. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jonas. That's very kind. I also have extremely fond memories of being in Principia. And uh, I only wish that we could be with you now in, in Florianopolis. That would be a wonderful thing. But we'll save that for a future occasion. Uh, it would certainly be something to look forward to once again. Uh, and let me say thank you to the, the whole team, to Ivan, uh, Jerzy, Cesar, uh, Jonas, of course, Alexander, Deborah, Brownie, uh, for such a beautifully organized conference. It, it's so well done that I was kind of hoping that you would just go all the way and organize an end to the pandemic so that we could all be there in person. Uh, but I'm guessing you just ran out of time. So thanks for all of the other things that you did. And of course, thanks to everyone here for joining in now at the end of what I know uh, has been a long and exciting day. Uh, and oh, I should mention for those of you who just joined us uh, that there's a brief sort of outline type handout for the talk. Uh, the link to it has been posted in the Zoom chat, um, but perhaps uh, Jonas or somebody else could um, in a minute or two just post it there again so that anyone who's joined us late can have access to it. It'll just help you to keep track of where we are in the grand scheme of things. Now, for those of you who read my abstracts, you will know that the talk I'm going to give today is taking certain liberties with the theme of models and modeling in the sciences. Uh, on the one hand, my primary focus today isn't really scientific models per se, but rather what we might call models of scientific education. On the one hand, uh, you know, discussing models of scientific education isn't, I'm sure, what most people have in mind by the theme of the conference. But on the other hand, I will be invoking the idea of knowledge transfer, which is, I think, a fascinating topic in the literature on scientific modeling to clarify certain points that I'll be making along the way. So hopefully that will please at least some of you, and perhaps a few of the rest of you will enjoy venturing into some slightly different territory today. So let me dive in. For the purposes of today, I have a particular focus in mind in thinking about scientific education. Many would agree, I'm sure, that in addition to the important intellectual functions that science serves, say, satisfying desires for knowledge and explanation and so on. One crucial function is to contribute toward the welfare of people and of society and thereby serve the common good. In a democratic society, in order to bring our best science to bear successfully, or at least as effectively as we can in serving the common good, widespread support for this particular role for science seems essential, since widespread support is generally, though not always, of course, a major determinant in the shaping of public policy and governance by our elected representatives. In fact, as we know, public support is clearly a non-negligible factor in shaping policy and governance in some non-democratic societies as well. And many would further agree that the most obvious route to widespread support of this kind is widespread understanding. In other words, the greater the extent to which society as a whole understands our best science, the greater the likelihood of consequential public support for science-based policy and governance. And finally, it's a truism that public understanding of science is a function of science education whatever forms that may take. I'm going to assume all of that agreement as a starting point for today. Assuming all of these things, though, leaves a lot to be clarified and disputed about 
what sort or sorts of scientific education would, in fact, serve the goal of enhancing public support for the uptake of science in confronting the many challenges that our societies face. For one thing, there are different kinds of challenges to scientific understanding, and having a clear picture of them may suggest the appropriateness of different antidotes in different cases. For another thing, whatever scientific education uh, may be an appropriate antidote, antidote for, it remains to be agreed what this education should comprise exactly. So my aim today is to argue that common conceptions of the public understanding of science corresponding to some common conceptions of scientific literacy just are not up to the task of enhancing public support. And in their place, I'm going to argue for a different conception, at least I'm going to describe the beginnings of a different conception, a conception that emphasizes a particular understanding of what science is and can deliver as a problem solving endeavor that shared, I think, by all and otherwise conflicting accounts of the nature of science. So here's the, the menu for today. Next, what I'm going to do is, is briefly outline the main challenges to improving levels of public understanding. The most frequently advocated proposal for doing this is to change educational priorities in such a way as to improve levels of scientific literacy. So I'll consider that next. And then I'm going to argue that the two most prominent versions of this proposal in recent decades, uh, as they're generally conceived, just aren't going to work. And then taking inspiration from some recent work on the idea of knowledge transfer, I'll explore the conditions under which transfers are in fact successful, which I hope may set the stage for uh, a positive proposal or at least a sketch of where a positive proposal might go at the end. What's required, I think, to enhance public support for the use of science to act on the most pressing problems of our day is not so much the idea of greater scientific literacy as this is typically conceived, but rather a kind of philosophical literacy with respect to science, of what precisely science is and what it's for. So here we go. To start, let me distinguish between what I'll call intrinsic and extrinsic challenges to public understandings of science. Intrinsic challenges derive from features of science itself, including both scientific practices and the outputs of scientific investigation, like theories and models, right, that inevitably problematize the widespread understanding of science beyond certain specialist communities of, say, scientists, students, right, and other experts, like philosophers of science. Extrinsic challenges derive from strictly extra scientific interventions in both scientific work and the reception of the outputs of this work by non-experts. By undermining public understanding in various ways, both intrinsic and extrinsic challenges act as powerful impediments to widespread support for science-based policy and governance. So let me just clarify this distinction briefly. The notion of intrinsic challenges to public understanding is very familiar. As in any specialist area, in order to grapple with the subject matter in depth and with the required precision, the sciences employ uh, technical terms and concepts. Uh, they're often elaborated in terms of highly sophisticated mathematical, statistical, computational, and other terms, uh, other tools of description and analysis none of which can reasonably be expected to make much, if any sense at all, to anyone who's lacking the immersive training that mastering these languages and tools requires right, for understanding. In fact, as we know, as in many branches of study, degrees of subspecialization within the sciences have rendered many areas of research effectively inaccessible even to other scientists that work within the same broad disciplines. And so it's hardly surprising that the intrinsic complexities 
of specific targets of interest, uh, tools of investigation and description, and resulting theories and models are, for the most part, utterly opaque to non-experts, which inevitably, inevitably produces challenges to public understanding, what I'm calling intrinsic challenges. The severity of these challenges is evidenced, I think, and for example, in the highly variable nature of science reporting, right? in things like magazines, uh, newspapers, online platforms. I'm sure all of you have had the frustrating experience of reading a popular report of science and just wondering what on earth the person is doing. Right? Here, I mean, a lack of attention to or misunderstandings of the intrinsic complexities of the relevant science are not exactly uncommon. In addition to this, impediments to public understanding stemming from extrinsic interventions have attracted a lot of attention in recent years in cases where powerful individuals, um, say, in addition to individuals, social and political organizations, uh, corporations, all of these sorts of things have attempted to subvert scientific knowledge that would otherwise compromise the pursuit of their own social, political, and economic interests. There is some excellent history, philosophy, and sociology of science that has documented cases in which science has been corrupted at the source, for example, uh, by the funding of specific research programs by investors interested in generating particular results, um, or undermined by misrepresentations of scientific work that are publicized to serve ideological aims whose pursuit might otherwise be derailed by our best science. So examples abound, right? Uh, funding effects produced by tobacco and pharmaceutical companies, uh, campaigns aimed at misrepresenting climate science by the fossil fuel industry, uh, misinformation about the risks of potential side effects disseminated by anti-vaccine movements, right? and so on. Similarly, advocates of pseudoscience, that is claims or systems of belief or practice that masquerade as having the methodological rigor of science, so things like astrology or homeopathy or parapsychology, these things may disrupt public understandings of genuine science, even if they lack uh, the explicit um, intention to do so. Often, suggestions for how we might best tackle these extrinsic challenges to public understanding really amount to suggestions for tackling intrinsic challenges, which isn't surprising if you think about it, right? I mean, after all, pointing to surprising coincidences in which research funded by interested parties produces results, uh, results that are uh, beneficial to those parties, or cases in which lobbyists for certain ideological positions just happen to come equipped with their own results in support of their causes, that may be sufficient to raise suspicion, if not thoroughgoing skepticism, about those claims. But in many cases, in order to make criticisms of extrinsic intervention stick, it's helpful to demonstrate their epistemic failings in more detailed ways. And this amounts to demonstrating how misrepresentations of science and pseudoscience fall short of the standards of genuine science, which thus requires overcoming intrinsic challenges to public understanding. Furthermore, raising suspicions about extrinsic intervention is only half the battle. Right? It isn't all by itself sufficient to raise con uh, confidence in the alternative, namely our best science, as something that's worthy of inclusion in discussions of policy and governance instead. So a lot hangs on overcoming intrinsic challenges to public understanding. And that's where I'll turn next. All right. Understanding in this context requires degrees of comprehension or mastery that can't be had without an education, right? Whether it's formal or informal, or to what extents are questions I'll leave aside today. I don't think it always needs to be formal. In fact, a lot of us as philosophers of science may have some training in the sciences, but we've also probably had to learn a lot of science, right? Outside of the contexts of formal training. Right? 
So I'm going to leave that question aside for now. But the idea that having interestingly, you know, uh, um, in, uh, impressive degrees of comprehension or mastery uh, requires education is something on which all educators agree, right? The disagreement comes when we start to think about what the content of that education should be. In recent decades, two answers to this question have been especially prominent. In more abstract terms, both of them are advocating for greater scientific literacy. But more concretely, the first conceives of literacy in a relatively narrow way, and the second in a substantially broader way. So two approaches to scientific understanding, scientific literacy construed narrowly and broadly. I want to argue next that at least so far as the task of improving the public understanding of science is concerned, neither has been conceived in a way that's likely to lead to success. So let's take each in turn. Scientific literacy narrowly construed is concerned with scientific knowledge, the descriptive content of our best theories and models. So Norris and Phillips, these are authors who've written a lot about scientific education, describe this as what they call the fundamental sense of scientific literacy. It's a sense that emphasizes the ability to read and write scientific uh, um, work itself in some way, shape, or form, right, as a kind of measure of understanding. They contend that if a scientific education doesn't provide this, right, and here I quote them, it's not likely to achieve the good for citizens and society that we all desire, end quote. So here we have a direct connection being drawn between what's undoubtedly a well-entrenched dictionary definition type rendering of the term literacy, right, in terms of the competent execution of reading and writing, and positive consequences for public understanding. And as these authors and many others have rightly noted, understanding the descriptive content of science and possessing the sorts of skills that might facilitate this, such as the ability to understand uh, the relevance of data and analysis, the expression of degrees of confidence, in reported findings, and so on, uh, various devices in terms of which these things are expressed, like graphs and diagrams, all of this would certainly amount to a level of understanding that may favor the use of at least some of our best science in acting for the good of society. So far as it goes, this is the good news, I think, about scientific literacy narrowly construed. Here's the bad news. As a means to the end of widespread understanding, achieving sufficiently highly distributed levels of this sort of literacy is utterly utopian. I mean, it dramatically underestimates the complexities of modern science and the standards of education required to achieve that sort of proficiency. I've already mentioned a number of intrinsic challenges, right, including uh, the use of technical concepts and advanced mathematics, and the fact that these things don't simply comprise a manageable suite of tools that you can learn once and then apply across the sciences. Rather, they're often highly idiosyncratic to the very specific subfields in which they're used. Add to this scientific techniques of abstraction, which is important uh, in the context of the modeling literature. So here's where, for example, uh, causally relevant parameters that are used to investigate target phenomena are parsed in different ways for different purposes. Add the routine use of idealizations in which aspects of these targets are represented in ways that scientists often know, not always, but often know them not to be, in part for reasons of mathematical or computational tractability. Um, add in the ubiquity of approximations uh, and implicit understandings within fields regarding things like how well established or conjectural current theorizing may be, all of which again is highly contextual across different subdomains of physics, chemistry, biology, and the social sciences, let alone science simpliciter. It's simply unrealistic in the extreme to imagine that pertaining to our best science, 
cutting edge science on the most pressing issues of our day, uh, genetic modification, climate change, artificial intelligence, etc. It's unrealistic in the extreme to imagine that this sort of literacy is something that could be inculcated in a majority of citizens. It requires a specialized education over significant durations of time, and not even scientists are capable of it across the breadth of the sciences. In fact, the impracticability of achieving widespread levels of scientific literacy narrowly construed is much more severe than even this suggests because, of course, the sciences don't stand still. So whatever non-specialists acquire today will inevitably be modified and replaced over time as technical concepts, forms of data collection and analysis, and so on evolve. Scientific literacy narrowly construed is surely a good thing, but it will never be the basis of a widespread public understanding. Okay, so let's turn to consider a second prominent conception of scientific literacy that has likewise come to the fore in recent decades. What I've called scientific literacy broadly construed, broadly now, is less concerned with scientific knowledge per se and more concerned with a knowledge of science that is, of science conceived more generally as a practice or a set of practices of investigation and knowledge generation. Now, this too is undoubtedly a good thing, but as I'll now suggest, scientific literacy broadly construed, at least as it's being conceived in recent times, has no real potential to form the basis of a public understanding of science that supports including it in decision-making for the common good. So first, let's clarify what a knowledge of science, right, or the nature of science is more precisely. Identifying it with uh, theories as opposed to, or sorry, identifying it with scientific practices as opposed to the descriptive content of theories and models, um, that's a start, but a lot hangs here on what's included in this idea of practices. For example, does it include techniques of investigation, uh, say the use of instruments and other technologies of observation, detection, measurement, data collection? Uh, how about techniques of analysis, right? The use of mathematics, statistics, computer simulations, and other procedures involved in moving from data to conclusion. The methods of the sciences are surely part of their nature, but as you've guessed already, right, given the partial overlap here with the things I just mentioned in connection with scientific literacy narrowly construed, including scientific methods in a conception of literacy broadly construed is likewise a non-starter for enhancing public understanding. All of the same concerns apply. Scientific methods are intricate and complex. Uh, their mastery requires um, all kinds of substantial training over significant periods, durations of time. Uh, they're remarkably uh, uh, variable across scientific disciplines and subdisciplines. They're apt to change and evolve over time. As such, for reasons that we've already covered, if we take the methods of the modern sciences seriously, they can't plausibly be considered an effective cornerstone of efforts to achieve widespread public understanding. And perhaps appreciating this, although they don't come out and say it in quite the way I've just described, most appeals to what I'm calling scientific literacy broadly construed take a different tack. They appeal in various ways to features of the sciences that are the primary focus of the field of, wait for it, the history and philosophy of science, HPS. What these appeals have in common is the idea that incorporating HPS or philosophy of science into science curricula would be a good thing. And, you know, I think a version of that idea is right. But are you ready for the bad news? I mean, when you look right, in scientific education, it's actually very difficult to discern a positive case for why adding HPS or philosophy of science to science education would be, in fact, a good thing. The driving underlying intimation here appears to be something like the suggestion that 
insights from HPS will instill the view that the sciences are epistemically virtuous in certain ways. They're rational, objective, uh, they're reliable producers of knowledge, and so on. But that is undermined by the very morals that this work commonly identifies as emanating from HPS, or the philosophy of science. So let me just illustrate this with a few examples. So one proponent, um, Ennis, advocates integrating a number of what he calls results from HPS into science education. These results include the idea that scientific claims are subject to, and I'm just going to um, gesture when I'm quoting him, um, scientific claims are subject to unmentioned qualifications, uh, that they're tentative and subject to revision, and that they're sometimes vague and imprecise. Those are some of the results of HPS scholarship. Now, of course, in a sense, none of that is incorrect, but what, without embedding these facts into a systematic or more substantial account of the epistemology of science, something that scholars in HPS and philosophy of science routinely do, but which the authors concerned with scientific literacy rightly seem to agree would be largely beyond the capacities of a science curriculum. It's difficult to see how one might characterize these so-called results as indicative of the epistemic virtues of science, certainly in a way that would then bolster widespread support for science-based policy and governance. Similarly, in an extensive review of this literature, uh, McComas et al. contend that while there's significant disagreement within HPS about the nature of science, there is, in fact, they say, a consensus view regarding aspects that are, quote, most important for a scientifically literate society. And in fact, they make a list of 14 bullet points comprising this consensus, right? As a philosopher of science, it's, it's really fun and kind of amazing to read, right? But sadly, right, there's very little in this list of 14 bullet points that would clearly support the notion that science is something that should inform decision-making in the public domain. Some of these things are just are epistemically neutral. So things like um, scientists are creative or science is part of social and cultural traditions. Those are a couple of the bullets. Others might easily engender skepticism about other passing references they make to uh, say experimental evidence and rational arguments, right? So other bullets are things like observations are theory laden or um, scientific ideas are affected by their social and historical milieu. Again, the point isn't that any of this is incorrect, right? Or that there can be no resolution of what might otherwise seem to be contradictory features of science regarding the likelihood of its producing trustworthy knowledge. Rather, it's that giving an account of scientific knowledge that achieves this more detailed, this more nuanced understanding would require a much fuller engagement with the details of HPS scholarship than is practicable in what these revisions to the science curriculum um, would take to be practicable. Now, in fact, while I'm on a roll, let me just say that I think this bad news for scientific literacy broadly construed, at least insofar as we imagine it to be a means to the end of greater public understanding, is quite a bit worse than I've just suggested. It's not merely the case that abstracting certain facts about scientific practice from the nuanced understandings of them elaborated in the scholarly discipline of HPS can't hope to do the work of facilitating widespread public understanding for reasons of impracticability. It's furthermore that, as we know, there's deep disagreement within HPS, right, within the philosophy of science, regarding how these abstracted facts should be understood concretely as exemplifying knowledge or not, as the case may be. There are long-standing and uh, very um, detailed articulations of debates here. And there's no, there's no settled consensus regarding how best to think about the epistemic status 
of our best science. I mean, Otavio and I are in the same department and we have every opportunity to convince one another and we still don't agree about anything. So this exposes the fragility of McComas's et al's claim that, and I'll quote them again, the issues included in the following table, right, of their consensus bullet points are complex, but we are making recommendations for K to 12 students and their teachers, right, kindergarten to grade 12. We're making recommendations for those people, not, they say, for future philosophers of science. But the putative consensus underwriting scientific literacy broadly construed is a sham, right? It's built on a foundation of conflicting views in HPS regarding how those issues should be understood. So this is far from a promising basis for an education with which to facilitate public understanding in the service of the common good. Okay, so how should we think about the public understanding of science? Well, before I turn to some gesturing on that topic, and as I mentioned at the start, I'd like to step back for a moment and think more carefully about the general phenomenon of attempting to extract knowledge from one domain and then transferring it effectively into a different domain. By doing this, I think we stand to gain some clearer insight into why these conceptions of scientific literacy I've just discussed are incapable of doing the work I hoped they do. And also, um, we might gain a clearer conception of what sort of proposal might succeed instead. So let's follow a number of philosophers of science here and call this phenomenon knowledge transfer. The idea has earlier antecedents, I think, but over the past decade, a number of us have become especially interested in how scientific theorizing or modeling in one context of the sciences sometimes ends up being incredibly useful and effective in entirely different contexts. So what I mean by that is something is extracted right, from one place, right, from one field or subfield or context of theorizing, right? And it's plugged into something quite different, perhaps entirely different, but it functions well there. By which I mean, it's able to do some positive epistemic work right, in that different context. So for example, uh, there have been fascinating studies of how models developed in say uh, game theory ultimately found their way into biology or how modeling in physics ultimately found its way into economics and so on. The idea is that in some cases, we're able to extract some knowledge that functions very well over here and do something good with it over here. Now, with the public understanding of science in mind, what I want to do is generalize or extend this notion of transfer further than is intended right, in this literature. I'm not so much interested in transferring knowledge between contexts of scientific practice, which involves applying a model or some other scientific description to different areas of scientific interest. Instead, what I'm interested in is the idea of transferring knowledge between scientific contexts on the one hand and broader public or societal contexts on the other. And there are some illuminating analogies and disanalogies, I think, between how knowledge is transferred between strictly scientific contexts and how it's transferred beyond scientific context into the broader public domain. So let me mention just a couple of them um, here today. Here's what happens in knowledge transfer between scientific contexts. When we move from uh, one context to another, the subject matter, the target systems under consideration are different. But there's something about them that's the same. Right? In other words, there's some analogy or similarity between them that allows the knowledge transfer to work. So often, not always, but often, what's shared is a formal or structural similarity. So by structure here, I just mean uh, some set of relations between parameters. It may be mathematical, computational, causal, what have you. The important thing is that in many cases, even though the semantics or the interpretation of that structure varies between contexts, that's how you get, for example, 
one and the same model being useful, say, in physics and economics. Despite that, some useful knowledge transfer occurs, despite the fact that these are different areas of interest. Because embedded within their own context of interpretation, they're able to function well. When there is, in fact, some similarity of the sort between the two contexts that allows them to function well, knowledge transfer is successful. Now, the idea of there being something shared or similar across scientific contexts is analogous to the notion of knowledge transfer from scientific context to societal ones. Typically, what's shared is supposed to be some sort of factual description, say, for example, about the efficacy of a vaccine, a claim, a view, a theoretical assertion, a prediction, a retrodiction, an explanation. But here, in a disanalogy to the idea of transfers between scientific contexts, where we seem to be able to meet the challenge of figuring out how to interpret some shared information in a different way in a different domain, when it comes to science to society transfers, this challenge just isn't generally being met, or at least not very well. The reason for this is that typically, public contexts don't or simply can't produce interpretations of the relevant scientific content that would allow for successful transfer. Many of the difficulties I discussed earlier regarding scientific literacy narrowly and broadly construed are, I think, examples of this. Okay, so I know that sounds very abstract. Right? Uh, let me try to unpack it in more concrete terms. Basically, the idea is that scientific claims are embedded in larger and richer interpretive contexts and when an interpretive context doesn't mesh well enough with whatever it is that you're attempting to transfer from one place to another, then the transfer is bound to fail. So here's an example. It's what um, on your handout I've called translational challenges. Obviously, when everything's going well, scientists engaged in a particular area of research have some significant understanding of what's going on, that is, of the descriptive content of that research. Likewise, uh, I think we'd be happy to say that historians and philosophers of science, and sometimes science journalists, have a significant understanding of the science that they think deeply about. Now, what happens when scientists, historians, philosophers, journalists speak in the public sphere about scientific knowledge? Translational challenges are ones of determining how to describe the content of science in a way that's accessible to non-scientific audiences. A description that does justice to the details is often simply inaccessible because the background knowledge, that sort of background semantic context that's required to grasp it, which is possessed by scientists and those who study science carefully, is simply lacking more generally. On the other hand, descriptions of the content of science that don't really do justice to the details, in other words, simplified descriptions, are often simply false or misleading. And even with the best will in the world, it's often very difficult and sometimes impossible to get the balance just right between giving sufficient detail to avoid telling falsehoods or misleading people and oversimplifying and saying something false. So for example, um, in hopes of making something accessible, we sometimes transfer highly abstract or idealized descriptions of scientific research into public contexts. But those descriptions are, as we know, strictly speaking, false. And in some cases, this even plays right into the hands of people who seek to undermine science. These are the extrinsic interveners I mentioned earlier. And then the translation fails. So here's a, just a toy illustration of this, just to clarify the idea. In high school, in many parts of the world, we teach that there's a uniquely privileged procedure for investigating nature the scientific method. It's privileged in the sense that when it comes to inquiring into the nature of things of scientific interest, the scientific method is like a recipe for making truths. Now, as it turns out, the idea of a method is an abstraction from some very specific forms of scientific investigation, especially those found in experimental disciplines. But there are lots of different forms of scientific investigation, and not all of them fit that precise mold very well. Right? There is no one method. 
right? If you look at the amazing variety of practices that fall under the heading of the sciences, from say, you know, uh, I don't know, investigating animal behavior, right, to modeling quantum gravity, there just isn't a recipe that amounts to a common method, right? Unless perhaps you describe it at such a level of abstractness, right? So generically that it effectively becomes empty. And since you're philosophers of science, I don't need to go on at length about this, but you know, from what Newton called his uh, method of deduction from the phenomena to what looks like the use of inference to the best explanation in Darwin, uh, to Einstein's use of thought experiments, to Alistair Crombie's styles of knowing and Ian Hacking's styles of reasoning, right? I think you get the idea. The translation of the complexity of scientific methods into the admittedly inspiring, but nevertheless highly abstracted idea of the scientific and method fails in part because as a description of what it takes to be genuinely scientific, a necessary condition of science, as it were, it's false. And one consequence of this is that it makes some scientific knowledge vulnerable to the promotion of skepticism, right? It makes it too easy um, for uh, certain extrinsic interveners to point at certain points of science that aren't well described by it and say, well, clearly you shouldn't believe this. It doesn't even employ the scientific method. Now, that's a simplistic, as I said, a kind of toy example of what, are, what I nevertheless take to be a serious class of challenges to science to society knowledge transfer, what I'm calling translational challenges. Here's a second class of challenges. What's the upshot of our best science? I mean, in terms of knowledge. The answer to that question, of course, is contested by philosophers of science. I mean, just consider, for instance, the impressive array of forms of scientific realism and anti-realism that have been articulated, which on another day I might have been talking about instead. I mean, collectively, these positions represent a number of disagreements about how best to conceive of the epistemic upshot of the sciences. All of these people think that our best science gives us knowledge, but taken together, they differ regarding what that knowledge output is exactly. Let me call this second class of impediments to science to society knowledge transfer interpretational challenges. You can think of the particular uh, example of it that I've just given concerning realism and anti-realism in terms of a broad opposition between um, what I'll call somewhat generically instrumentalism on the one hand and appeals to approximate truth on the other. Instrumentalism here, at least as I'm using the term, is just the idea that the sciences are tools for doing things, for manipulating things, intervening in things, uh, in changing the way things are, that is in changing states of affairs often in the hopes of tackling a problem, like a virus, in order to produce a specific outcome, like not getting sick. Instrumentalism is concerned with what works and getting things to work in ways we desire. Of course, it's compatible with and can be supplemented by more detailed theses about the semantics of scientific terms, the aims of science, and all kinds of other things. But in the sense I'm using it here, the core of instrumentalism is neutral with respect to these more fine-grained elaborations, right? Stripped down to its core, instrumentalism is inherently quietist about many epistemic questions. On the other hand, approaches to interpreting scientific descriptions that emphasize approximate truth go further. They explain why our best science is so instrumentally effective in terms of the truth and reference of certain underlying descriptions, all of which is taken to be supported by our evidence. This is the basis, for example, of the, the famous or infamous, depending on uh, where you sit with respect to the fence, uh, miracle argument for scientific realism. There's no consensus about how we should interpret our best science here, and so no consensus about how to answer the question about what the upshot of science is precisely in terms of knowledge, not among philosophers of science, and sometimes not even among scientists. 
This is a prime example, I think, of an interpretational challenge to science, to society, knowledge transfer. Okay, there's much more to say about this, no doubt, but uh, time is fleeting. So let me turn now to say just a few words about what I take to be the moral of all of this discussion of transferring knowledge from scientific contexts into the public domain and for the public understanding of science. And even more specifically, for the sort of public understanding that would ideally support the use of science in pursuit of the common good. So to conclude, the positive proposal I want to make may ultimately be viewed as constituting a different sort of conception of scientific literacy, one that I hope will overcome the difficulties I've raised for the notions of literacy narrowly construed and broadly construed. In the time I have left, I won't attempt to demonstrate this to you in any painstaking way, in part because I'm still working out to my own satisfaction how best to articulate it, and I still have work to do there. But I can certainly leave you with a sketch of where I hope to go, because I think the kernel of this view is implicit in uh, the recent history of philosophy. When the logical empiricists undertook to establish the sciences as the exemplary means by which to produce knowledge of the world, it wasn't, of course, just for its own sake. It was because they took properly scientific knowledge to be a basis for engaging in and bringing about social and moral progress. At the same time, when the pragmatists advocated for the notion that concepts like truth and knowledge must be understood as having a pragmatic dimension, that what it is for a claim to be meaningful at all must be understood in part on the basis of what we can do with it. They were articulating a view of how the sciences are tied to practical consequences in human experience. Now, views like empiricism and pragmatism are often associated with the scientific anti-realist side of debates between realists and anti-realists. That is, with what I was calling, in a somewhat technical way, instrumentalism. But I think this obscures something that's actually key to a proper conception of how we should think about the public understanding of science. Everyone, whether or not they think that the sciences are merely instrumentally useful, think that they can be and are instrumentally useful. All epistemologies of science, realist and anti-realist alike, endorse the view that the sciences embody the best techniques we've managed to develop and continue to develop from manipulating, intervening, changing states of affairs, tackling problems, and producing desired outcomes. As I said a moment ago, this is the basis of the miracle argument. Where they differ is in how they account for this success, which is, of course, an excellent philosophical question and one that's worthy of debate, but that doesn't undermine the more fundamental underlying agreement. And it's this agreement, I think, that should be at the heart of an effective public understanding of science and the focus of a general science education. There's an important story to be told here, I think, about how, despite all of the differences in what these various people I've just adverted to, think about scientific knowledge, they all recognize the same capacities of the sciences for acting in the world, and thus, by extension, for promoting our collective welfare. There's a shared and powerful conception here about what the sciences can achieve. What's crucial to the public understanding of science is an appreciation of the fact that, by design, the sciences comprise a highly effective set of techniques which, collectively, function like a sort of machine for generating answers to questions and solutions to problems concerning the natural and social worlds in which we live. And I think, you know, it's just in the nature of communities of specialists like ours to focus on the things about which they disagree and then to think about those issues as representing all of what's interesting about their specialism. But in the process, uh, shared commitments naturally fall by the wayside. They're not interesting because we agree about those things. But when it comes to thinking about the public understanding of science, 
and about what conception of scientific literacy might actually support the practicable development and achievement of widespread understanding that favors a central role for science in acting to serve the common good, I think it's time for realists and anti-realists alike to return to the question, right? the question that was foremost in the mind of logical empiricists and pragmatists and others earlier in the 20th century, to return to the question of what we actually mean by the success of science, to articulate more clearly and fully the part of their understanding of science that they actually share and on which their different interpretations of the epistemic upshot of the sciences depend. Doing that is part of a larger project that I've only just started working on recently. Um, it's a book tentatively entitled Science in the Public Eye. So stay tuned for that and thank you very much. Thank you, Anton, for this very nice talk. Now we still have time for questions and everyone who wishes to make a question, you either type question or raise their hands. I prefer if you type question because then I can see the order where you have typed it. But uh, let me just anticipate here. I see Catherine Elgin raised her hand first. So please, Catherine, and then we go ahead. Please, Catherine Elgin, you can make your question. Mute me. I can't. I like what you're doing, but I'm not sure it does what you want it to do. Because what it seems to me that you do that's very much worth doing, and that I would say is science in the public good, is to enable people to appreciate more what science does. But it doesn't obviously promote you had it um, talking about how producing desired outcomes. But what, if you want the public good, it's got to be producing desirable outcomes and not just desired outcomes. So, so the word, I mean, unless you are like me and want to say the world is a better place if more people understand science, that's it. Uh, but if we're talking about vaccines and climate change and less crime in the streets and stuff like that, then you need another step to get from, if only you understood this stuff better, you'd promote policies to do that stuff better. And I don't know that what you've got enables the last step. Thanks a lot, Catherine. So uh, that's a, a, a great question um, because I think it uh, puts its finger on exactly the sort of thing I had in mind. And I don't actually take what I'm saying uh, to uh, to be opposed to what you're advocating. In fact, I I think that I, perhaps I've just been a little bit too telescopic in talking about desired outcomes. I think that um, the fact that we have the policies and governance we have today is precisely because desired outcomes are being achieved. They just happen to be the outcomes desired by uh, you know, very powerful people. And so if it turns out that what is desirable to uh, larger groups of people that are able to organize themselves politically and otherwise, right, um, come to the fore, then those desired outcomes will be the ones that are realized. In other words, I don't see there being a conflict between my talk of desired outcomes and desirable outcomes. Part of what I'm advocating for is that if the public understanding of science includes centrally um, the idea that the sciences are, um, are things that are you know, designed for and very effective at realizing outcomes that we desire, right? um, then we should marshal them in ways that will achieve our desires. So I don't think there's any conflict between saying that um, they achieve our desired outcomes or ones that are desirable. In fact, it's precisely because I want people to think of the sciences as a primary or central route to achieving their desires, right? That I think that that should be a core element um, of what it is 
to understand what the sciences are up to. So I don't actually see a conflict. I mean, is there well, an extra step involved? Sorry, there isn't necessarily a conflict, but what I'm concerned about is that if we just stick with what you've got, we haven't protected against, say, um, putting our th somebody's thumb on the scale to use what we know about um, motivation in a way that would inhibit things. Well, that's true, but that's that's in part because what I've suggested isn't a, a political action plan. What I've suggested is a way of thinking about what it is that the sciences are doing, that if it were well understood by a broad swathe of the public, would lead them then, I think, to um, take our best science and use it to pressure our representatives to use it in a way that brings about their desires because they understand that what the sciences are, right, centrally, is a set of mechanisms for bringing about those sorts of desires. I think if they don't have that concept to begin with, then there's no sense talking about what's desirable um, and science as a means of achieving it because they're not even thinking about the sciences in those terms. So what I'm suggesting is that a core part of what it is to inform and educate people with respect to what the sciences are and what they can achieve is this notion that there are a set of mechanisms for achieving those kinds of desires. And I think if people understand that, if that's part of a widespread conception of public understanding, then we can do exactly what you suggested, which is that then we can work out right, what we take to be desirable and we can bring our joint voices to bear. But unless a majority of people think of the sciences in that way, that won't even be possible. And right now we have, you know, I don't know, 50% of the population in our country, at least, that don't think of the sciences in that way. Okay, good. Now we have a question by Otavio. Okay, well, thanks, Anjan. As you know, I'm very sympathetic with uh, your overall project. And um, so what... What I'd like uh, to ask about is to press you a little more on the role of philosophy in that uh, overall project. As you know, uh, there's a very ancient tradition uh, that plays, put philosophy in the center of such a social project. That's Plato in the Republic, right? So the idea of a philosopher king was a, a certain conception of how philosophy can be led to the common good, right? We know where that end up, right? Uh, and also after, you know, over 2000 years of philosophy, now we realize philosophy is far more diverse and complex uh, to, to fulfill that kind of role, right? So imagine you, you identify the role of philosophy and you're speaking to a Farabendian, right? Who thinks that, oh, look, the common good emerges if we you know, explore all possibilities, right? And we put side by side science and all kinds of traditions um, with, with, you know, without much attention to, to evidence and, and, and so on, because maybe good ideas will come out of that. So I take it that you don't want to go that way, right? So then the, the question is, uh, can we legitimately find uh, a role for philosophy that it's not highly contentious in that context? I mean, how yeah. should sort these out? Yeah, good question. So uh, you're right, this certainly isn't an argument for making philosophers kings, uh, however much we might enjoy or hate that. Um, and in fact, you know, part of the argument that I uh, was making against what I called scientific literacy broadly construed was precisely the idea that some people, at least in the literature I've read in scientific education, seem to want to have their cake and, I don't know, not have it with respect to um, the role of philosophers, right? They appeal to HPS and the philosophy of science as yielding certain important insights that they would like to import into scientific um, curricula. And yet at the same time, um, they don't want, they precisely don't want to go into the kinds of details 
of elaboration and understanding that philosophers of science um, provide to actually give content right to those claims because well um, for some of the reasons you mentioned right we could go off in all kinds of directions and also just because you know then we'd be doing too much philosophy and not enough science in a science curriculum so i agree with you that i don't think the solution is to teach a whole bunch more philosophy or for philosophers to you know be involved in every science course or something like that what i'm advocating instead is that um, we have to think about how to entrench um, a picture of the sciences, an understanding of the sciences that um, is defined by what it is that, you know, various philosophers of science, despite all of their differences in thinking about the epistemic upshot of the sciences, actually have in common, which is a conception of the sciences as um, techniques and practices that generate a certain kind of success or certain kinds of success. And that conception, I think, is actually something that is relatively simple, although, you know, I didn't go to any lengths to try to articulate it here today. Um, that idea, I think, is something that doesn't require um, very sophisticated or lengthy, you know, philosophical training to grasp. Um, but it's something that I think, you know, if we could just make that the core of an understanding of what the sciences are and what they're doing, that would go a long way to promoting the idea um, that the sciences are things that are worth trusting and using in making important decisions. Now, then there's a question as to, you know, who should be implanting that message or who should be part of the communication of that message or entrenching that idea in students as they learn about the sciences or just learn, uh, you know, more generally about, you know, um, uh, about uh, culture. I mean, this is the kind of thing that could be taught in a lot of different domains. Should it be philosophers? Should it be scientists? Should it be others? I, I, I kind of think that the message itself is sufficiently um, philosophically uh, uncomplicated that it should be teachable in, in principle by a lot of different kinds of people. Um, I think the important thing is to um, just work out what that articulation is, right? How do we unpack this notion of the success of science? And then make it available to people to teach and convince them that this is the way they should present what the sciences are and what they do. And then after that, if you're interested in going into more detail about how that can be extended into, you know, further and more fine-grained interpretations, of course, you should contact your local philosophers of science and take a philosophy of science course, but that that shouldn't be essential, right, to having a basic conception of what the sciences are and what they do. Um, so, you know, I think we could help, but I think a lot of people could help. The message ultimately should be a very simple one. Right? I mean, I, I don't know why this analogy just popped into my head, but, um, you know, the film Inception, right, Christopher Nolan, who's one of my favorite writers and directors, well, you know, for those of you who haven't seen it, I'm sorry for this analogy, but for those of you who have seen it, the idea is that to bring about certain behaviors in people, right, it might suffice to implant an idea in their heads. But one of the crucial things about implanting an idea in their head is that you can't try to implant too complex an idea in their head to bring about a very specific behavior that's bound to fail, right? The more you try to implant in them, the less successful your attempt to get them to behave in a certain way will be. But if you implant something deep enough, that's simple enough, it could have a profound effect on their behavior. That's the my best take at describing the theme of the movie without destroying it for you if you haven't seen it, right? And, and what I'm suggesting is this, this notion of the sciences as at their core, right, a set of problem-solving endeavors that meet the description of success in ways that we can articulate. And that's it, right, as a core. That's something that should be able to be communicated and implanted in, in brains by a lot of different kinds of people. Thanks a lot, Anjan. Nice, thanks, Anjan Otavio. We now have a question by Renata. Please, Renata. Hi, 
Hi, Angel. Thanks a lot for your talk. And I couldn't prevent myself from thinking all the time about COVID-19. Uh, in the context of the pandemic, considering specifically this context, how to evaluate the role of academics and philosophers in communicating science and contrib contributing to understand of science, to understand the models employed to understand COVID-19, for example. I mean, which role do you think we have we have to or should play now? Um, do you have any insights about the current context we are living in? Sure. Well, I'm not sure I have insights that haven't already been thought and acted upon, actually, by all kinds of people who have done, I think, fantastic work to try to bring um, information and um, you know, uh, try to bring uh, common sense to uh, populations with respect to you know what. Is, sorry about that. Um, um, with respect to you know um, what best practices are for attempting to avoid infection, what best practices are for dealing with infection once you have it, what best preventative measures right we might entail now with the development of vaccines. I think that a lot of this has been very effectively um, articulated by um, people like us, philosophers of science and public forums, but certainly by um, people in the medical profession, by politicians, by uh, what do they call them, influencers, right? I mean, there are all sorts of people have communicated the information. The problem is that the, um, a large proportion of many of our societies are not receptive to the information, right? So the question is to, you know, what we can do. Um, well, I think we can only do what we can do. And I think a lot of people have been trying very hard, right? One of the reasons I think that people are not receptive to the information that's been provided. Uh, well, there are lots of reasons owing to, you know, the uh, um, social media uh, microcosms to which people belong. But, you know, one reason, one factor, I think, is something I was trying to touch upon in my talk, which is that I don't think a lot of people understand or take the sciences, our best science to be, a suite of tools and mechanisms are, you know, our best, our greatest hope for overcoming problems that face us. They just don't think of the sciences in that way. And that's why, in part, I'm advocating for a conception of scientific literacy that might be, you know, well learned by large numbers of people um, that embraces that so that people become more receptive to um, our best science. And that, of course, includes information like, you know, this is our best guess so far, right? And we'll be updating it on a week to week basis because, you know, we don't yet know how the coronavirus works and so on and so forth, right? I mean, people have to be receptive to the idea that these are our best techniques. They're the best we've got and, and thus we should rely upon them. So, you know, I think you're right to hint that lots of people probably have uh, important responsibilities in this regard. Anyone who has a public voice should be using it. Um, the problem I'm trying to get at here is something that I think underlies this. It's the idea that there are a lot of people for whom hearing messages of that sort is completely ineffective because they don't have a pro attitude toward what it is that science can achieve. Good. Thank you, Renata. And then now we have a question. I shall read it to you by Roger, Rogério Severo. He asks, isn't science in the public eye already focused on the success of science? The public doesn't focus on history and philosophy of science or scientific method, but, not, but on its outcome. How does your proposal differ from what we already have? Good. So I think what we have uh, currently, in a lot of cases, and this is what um, some of the literature in uh, what I've described as uh, advocating scientific literacy, narrowly construed and broadly construed, is reacting against. What we have is a lot of science teaching, which is focused purely on mastering uh, kind of formalisms um, without any reflection at all on 
what science is and what it's for and what it can do. So there's a lot of science teaching that says, you know, here are Newton's laws, master them, and then, uh, you know, memorize them, and then learn how to apply them to certain stock problems. Um, here are the uh, nucleic acids, right? Memorize how they can fit together in different ways so as to bring about different sorts of uh, molecules and compounds. Um, there's a lot of um, memory and rote application of scientific facts, but almost no reflection on what it is that science is for and what it can do. And so that's where I take actually not just myself, but also some of these people who I criticize heavily in my talk, but you know who I think are trying their best and on the right track to think about how we depart from a teaching of science that is just, you know, here are a bunch of equations, learn them, and that's science. Because that, I think, for most people, for, for people that are very unlike us, who may not be, you know, who are interested in the sciences, and you know, for the overwhelming majority of people who will not go on in the sciences, that is utterly alienating. They couldn't care less. And so it should be no surprise, ultimately, that when faced with difficult situations and offered the possibility of using our best science as uh, a tool to help tackle those problems, that a lot of people don't have uh, a very strong um, um, attitude, pro-attitude towards the use of science in those contexts. Because for them, learning science was just learning a bunch of stuff that they didn't care about, that they didn't think was important for anything that would be meaningful in their lives, ultimately. So they took the class and then it was done, right? So, I mean, sadly, I think that's how most science is taught. And I think that the people that I criticized are actually attempting to bring us to a conception of scientific literacy that does much better than that. And I'm trying to take it one step further. Thank you, Vashan. Thank you, Hoshari, for the question. Now we have a question by Ivan. Please, Ivan. Hello, Hello, hi, Richard. thank you. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. Ivan, yes. Hi, Ivan. Ivan. So, okay, Ivan, yes. Oh, hi, Anjan. Uh, thank you very much for your talk and for a great topic. Thank you. Um, my question is much more a follow-up on uh, Catherine's and Otavio's question. I mean, you're, you're offering a proposal, which is interesting, uh, and you're thinking about people who don't uh, care about science or who don't uh, understand correctly science. But then, well, what about, and then you say that we could implant an idea of science well performed, of success of science and desirability of aims in society. But uh, the point is, there is also another idea being planted, an idea that science has nothing to do with desirability in society, with the aims of society. So the, the opposite idea seems also to be uh, being planted at this moment. So how do you deal with that? I mean, uh, you're describing some sort of uh, an ideal for society, something that uh, Otto Neurath would call an utopia, uh, but there's also someone else's utopia in implantation at the same time, how do we not, how do we escape from dystopia in this case? Thank you. Right. Okay, great. So I think the, you know, my talk of desires may have confused things a little bit because the, you know, the core notion, right, is just that the sciences are, um, you know, a set of tools, a set of practices um, that are highly effective, right, at doing stuff. Right, the the list of stuff, right, the things that they do, are comprised of the partial list that I gave, right, allowing us to manipulate things, allowing us to intervene in things, allowing us to change certain states of affairs, right, one in which we're infected with a virus to one in which we're no longer infected by a virus, right, all of those sorts of things fall under the headings of these sorts of uh, generic things that I said that we might imagine the sciences are good at doing. Right. Now, the question of what we want them to do is, strictly speaking, a separate question. And what I think I said not very well to Catherine is that, you know, until and unless we think of the sciences, right, 
in a very core and a very serious way as a set of practices that allow us to do these sorts of things. We can't even think about them as a set of practices that allow us to do things that we want, right? I mean, we need to think about them in the prior sense as a kind of prerequisite for then thinking about um, you know, what it is that we want to bring about, what states of affairs do we most want right, to bring about in society. And then where will we turn? Well, well, we'll turn to the sciences in part because we take it, we have a prior understanding that what the sciences are, right, are a bunch of practices that are good at allowing us to achieve things like that. Right? Now, there are all kinds of questions then that will follow about, well, you know, how do we determine as a society what we'd most like to do, what our priorities are, um, what things we should prioritize and what things we should leave aside. And those are, I think, really important questions. And I certainly haven't offered any uh, answer um, to how we might then tackle those questions. I think, you know, some people um, in the literature have started thinking about those questions, right? How should we organize the sciences so that they're responsive to right, the demands of a society and so on and so forth. Um, but let me just say that I think one of the virtues of thinking about um, scientific literacy in the first instance, in this kind of sense, in this kind of problem solving way, right, is that people can ask themselves right, what problems uh, they face. And then armed with a conception of the sciences according to which it is uh, a problem, a set of problem solving mechanisms, they can say, um, which of those mechanisms might help me with my problems? And I think that this is an effective, I, I would at least, I would hope an effective way of helping to inject discussions of values in science right, into this conversation, although I didn't touch on that today. Um, if you think about the impact of the sciences, right? I said it helps us to do all kinds of stuff. Some of those things have had negative impacts on people. And so they've created rather than solved problems for people. And so you can imagine people thinking, okay, this is a suite of tools for doing stuff. I don't like the stuff it's doing. Um, but since I recognize that it's a highly effective suite of tools for doing stuff, I would better, I had better use my voice to uh, join with people who would like it to be doing something else. And that's kind of a flat-footed way of introducing, I think, the idea that ultimately, um, you know, who gets to choose, right, which utopian vision we're moving toward? Well, you know, that's a question that based on your talk yesterday, I hope you will solve. Right? Um, but it's, it's a kind of question that I think we can entertain on the picture I've described of people thinking about the sciences first and foremost in these terms as a set of problem solving techniques, because then we can have conversations about what's desirable and what problems we most want to tackle and for whom. Thank you, Anjan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ivan. Now it's our turn, Johan. Sorry for the confusion before. Yes, thank you. My name is pretty close to Ivan at least pronunciation. So yeah, thanks for the talk. It was so, so uh, um, in, enticing. So I have a question slash suggestion here. I was thinking when you talk about the scientific literacy and the way in which philosophy can help, um, if uh, a move towards integrating better science and technology into this discourse will help. Because when you think about technology, first of all, the public you want it or you don't, especially Gen Z and the others are closer, epistemically speaking, to technology than to science. They know more about technology. I see this with my very young son who's eight. They know more if you look in terms of epistemic reach about technology. And when you talk about technology, the concept of success that is traded in your talk is easier to understand than the success of science because rather than comparing scientific theories or models, you compare basically object and technologies and artifacts which can kind of compete better. And then there is a, this uh, idea that future science will be very technologically driven and laden through computational tools uh, and data intensive science and 
all these uh, new domains you mentioned, uh, CRISPR, uh, CRISPR technology, or you know, uh, scanning the, uh, the you do, doing astronomy and all this stuff, in which science, pure science, if you separate it from technology, doesn't exist. It's more like connected in that sense. And I think that goes back to our history in philosophy of uh, in history of philosophy when Aristotle talks about episteme and techne. So it's not a new, completely new idea, but integrating more technology into this discourse may help your argument uh, somehow. All right, thank you. Thanks, Ion. So I think that's a, a, a very nice suggestion in a way. Certainly uh, when we talk about things like um, intervening, acting in the world so as to bring about certain kinds of outcomes, so on and so forth, um, the most obvious uh, mechanisms that come to mind are technological ones. Right? Um, and so I think you're absolutely right that that's uh, certainly a way of making uh, some of the things I want to say uh, especially vivid, because that's um, what would uh, most obviously come to mind. Um, that said, I think of that as kind of a, a window into or a way into uh, this discussion rather than uh, something that we should think of as uh, giving an exhaustive account, right, of the kind of public understanding of science we want. And that's in part because, um, you know, various people have problematized uh, the hard and fast distinctions that are, I think, sometimes easy to draw between science and technology and more basic science and applied science. Even people who are sympathetic, very sorry about this. I'm just going to take one second. That didn't sound like a question, so I thought I'd better deal with it. Um, I think that even people who uh, take that distinction seriously, and I think there are a lot of people who think it's problematic, even people who take that distinction seriously um, would, I think, um, very commonly hold that it's very difficult to imagine um, the uh, continuing, continual thriving of technology and applied science without work in more basic, what you called pure science. And so it's certainly the case that there are domains of the sciences in which I think the applied sciences can run and run and run without much recourse to uh, pure or more basic science. In part, that's because they have what they need from prior pure or basic science already in the bag. But I think that you know, if we think about the relationship between less applied and more applied science, purer right, and more applied science, um, it's going to turn out that they're intimately connected and that in many, if not all cases, one is a precursor for the other. And so you know, it would be a mistake to think of a conception of science that is exhausted by applications and techne, um, precisely because if we jettison the other, then we may not have techne for very long. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Anjan. Now we have a question by Otavio. Please, Otavio. Uh, in a way, this. Um, is a segue from your questions uh, because thinking for a second about the epigraph uh, that you put Louis one on your handout, um, uh, it's it's interesting because uh, at least the way he he presents it there um, when he says that whatever natural science may be for the specialist for educational purposes. It's knowledge of the conditions of human action. Um, of course, one way of reading that is to say, well, so we should forget about basic science, right? Because a lot of it will have very little to say, if anything at all, about human action. Uh, and it will be fairly remote uh, to get from there all the way to something that actually has some direct practical significance uh, into, into action. So, of course, in what you said, you already acknowledged that there is a role, a much larger role for science than, than just that, right? So, so then my question is, 
uh, to what extent are you then embracing uh, the some the, the kind of Dewey Dewey specter, uh, or do you want to distance yourself uh, from it or qualify in some way? I think I am actually uh, embracing Dewey's picture. Although that said, as an aside, I should mention that I'm not sure I would go along with everything that Dewey said about science education. I mean, you know, what we should do is there's kind of a, a practice school of science education that students should learn by, you know, doing things. And, you know, there's a whole other dimension to his recommendations for how science should be taught uh, that, you know, I, I don't have any particular view on or I might be a little bit skeptical about. But with respect to the quotation that I put on the handout, um, I think I am embracing what he says, in part um, for the reason uh, that I gave Jan, which is that I think it's really difficult to separate these things out. So when we talk about the conditions of human uh, action, what are we talking about? If we talk about um, the conditions underwriting the administering of a vaccine for COVID-19, you might say, well, you know, there are technologies involved, there are technologies of mRNA transcription, there are technologies of, you know, fabricating the vaccine, there are technologies for delivering these things, and so on and so forth. But all of that is intimately connected with the basic science that describes how mRNA works and, you know, the kind of genetic coding and splicing uh, and manufacture of the vaccine um, is intimately connected to the basic properties of RNA and mRNA molecules. And I don't see how you can divorce those things. So I think that all of those things are actually part of the conditions of the relevant action, right? If you didn't have that basic science knowledge, you wouldn't be able to wow. construct the vaccine in the first place. Yeah, no, I think that that's right. But then there is also whole chunks of science that uh, will have no connection whatsoever, right? Think about you're studying large cardinals, cardinals in set theory, right? Or if you're interested in um, sort of details about the first seconds of the universe, right? And uh, so a lot of it, you know, it's, it's fun and important and we may illuminate other relevant scientific and highly theoretical enterprises, but to expect it, that we'll somehow get down to anything uh, as concrete as a vaccine, it would be very hard. I think that's right. And I think that in a lot of cases, uh, basic research is like that, right? It's very difficult for people to foresee what, if any, practical consequences this work might have. But invariably, I think, you know, when you look back across the history of the sciences, you find that that work is then foundational for other things that happen that ultimately are connected in some ways to things we can do. So, you know, you could, I think, uh, mount a kind of a pragmatic argument for doing work of that kind because you never know. And in fact, um, in many cases, we found that basic research we've done has ultimately, even if, you know, a century later, allowed us to do things that we would not have been able to do otherwise were it not for earlier science. Now, with respect to cardinals and set theory, well, you know, that's math. <laughs> okay. And is this an argument? Uh, because, the, again, depends on how far you, you go, right? Feyerabend would push this and say, look, you never know. You might just well study, you know, Homeric um, gods uh, because, you know, maybe some good ideas will come out of that. <laughs> well, you know, uh, maybe some good will come of it. I'm not sure. But here I'm I'm relying, I think, on uh, a purely institutional conception of what we take to be the, the disciplines of the sciences. And there's nothing deep in that, really. I'm just thinking about, you know, attempts to give accounts of a phenomena in the natural and social worlds. And that isn't to say that developments in mathematics aren't extremely important, as you know, I was, I was joking, because, you know, this is an essential tool that we use in all kinds of ways in the sciences to provide descriptions and analysis of natural and social phenomena. So it's not as though it's separable in the way I just suggested jokingly. Thank you. Thank you, Otavio. Thank you, Anjan. Now we have reached our time, so we should thank Anjan again for this very nice talk.
We meet again tomorrow in our section. Thanks, everyone. Spidey says sorry. He just really had to go. Uh,